Um, welcome to the True Colours of Advocacy uh, professional development webinar for lived experience of suicide. My name is Martina McGrath and I'm the research officer with Rose in the Ocean. Uh, and you will see on your screen uh, some wonderful people who are members of the LGBTI QA plus suicide attempt action group. This uh, webinar is with some amazing um, lived experience advocates around the country who um, also come from diverse LGBTI communities and also happen to have, like myself, um, the intersection of um, having an experience of, of suicide attempt. So we thought this webinar would be really useful in terms of how do you bring all those parts of yourself plus more to, to the work and, and advocacy that you do. And, and, um, and each, of, um, each of our wonderful um, action group members are working in different places and con contributing in different ways. So um, one of the things we hear from, we know from working with lots of lived experience people is it's, it can be a skill development process in terms of knowing how to, how to do advocacy how do I do this lived experience advocacy? What is that? Um, so I thought that, that today's webinar, we could perhaps um, ask some questions of um, Chad and Anwen and Bridget about some of the things they've experienced and maybe they can share with us some of those, um, I won't call them successes and failures, I'll say they're challenges and opportunities that we, we learn from every, everything that doesn't quite go so well about, about what we can do differently. And we will keep it fairly informal. So as I said, I'll, I'll, we'll run through some questions and each of us will then, I guess, chime in if we've got something we want to add to, to what's been said already. So thank you. So I'm going to, to kick off with the question for, for the wonderful Bridget. So Bridget, can you please talk to us about a time uh, in lived experience advocacy that has real meaning to you? So in other words, how do you feel, how do you feel and have you, how do you continue to be an LGBTI QA plus lived experience advocate for change? What keeps you going and what some of the, I guess, some of the successes you've had? Yeah, so I would say, um, I guess, kind of what kind of um, brought me into it initially was actually doing sort of lived experience, sort of volunteer stuff um, and Initially, I didn't know what I was doing with advocacy. I just thought I was just volunteering for mental health organisations. Um, but I quickly kind of found that I really wanted to be a voice for LGBTQ plus people, since obviously I identify as part of the community. And I feel that we um, can be underrepresented sometimes. So in terms of our voice. So <laughs> I just, yeah, I kind of brought that in the different sort of organisations that I volunteered in, um, such as Black Dog and a few others, um, often bringing that part of my story to the forefront. And then I guess what kind of is so some successes have been actually once I've got into a paid role um, through an organisation, um, I've gotten to actually be so one of the main voices for the LGBTIQ plus or sort of lived experience sort of stuff that we do, or or say our governance committees, um, our pride committees that we have that are for staff and kind of um, not just be the voice, but kind of try and role model for everyone else what's sort of best practice as well. Um, yeah, so <laughs> I guess just uh, some sort of successes have been, yeah, getting into that sort of positions of getting to actually be part of the committees and being like one of the people who is the voice for the whole organisation around what's appropriate and what's um, what can change, really what are some opportunities for growth. Thank so, you. Yeah. Awesome. I love how you say um, accidentally falling into advocacy because I think, you know, I think we've kind of all done that in yeah. a way. We've kind of gone, hmm, so that's what I'm doing. Okay, so I know I want to make a difference, but I wasn't yeah. quite sure why you know so look um, do you want to tell us I've, I've kind of glossed over where you're actually all from so it'd love, be lovely if you could tell tell <laughs> us um, where, whereabouts you're situated in Australia um, and as much as uh, yeah do you want to about the role your current role and roles you're currently doing so that people know where you're from yeah sure these guys yeah so I'm based in Melbourne um, and 
I work as both, I work two, ro two roles in one organisation. So I'm a peer support worker. So I use my um, sort of lived experience in more one-to-one -one capacity or in group programs um, to support consumers uh, in community mental health. And then my other role is a consumer consultant, so more system advocacy, so uh, systemic advocacy. So trying to really change the systems within the mental health service um, and really bring that consumer voice or lived experience voice to my role. So I get to kind of really um, do both the uh, on the ground sort of stuff and then the more sort of broader picture stuff to really make change. Yeah. That's, that's really cool, hey, in terms of being on doing what I call, you know, on the ground operational type stuff, supporting people one-on-one, -on -one, but then having an opportunity and uh, see the system stuff that, that you know, how things and being able yeah. to be a, a voice in that space. So that's really, really cool. I do have another question for you, but I'm actually going to, 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 yep. to come over to, um, let's have a look to, to Chad and, and pose a question to you. Yep, eyes up, Chad. There's a question coming your way. So... So Chad, can you talk to us about your experiences of being a gay man in a regional town um, and being a, being an advocate for change? Yes, certainly. Um, so um, when I first came to the small town, rural town where I live in Grenfell, um, I was a bit scared because um, of all the stigma around, you know, the sexuality and I wasn't sure on how people were going to react to that but I found the rural community to be very embracing with that um, for myself and my partner. Um, it was a very um, huge change from the city from mm. the metropolitan areas because um, you did experience all that stigma, the bashing, the, the slang and slurs um, as well but out here it's just totally different, it's a different lifestyle and it's been great. Um, I work in suicide prevention um, for Western PHN at the moment, currently at the moment. Uh, we're one of six trial sites throughout Western New South Wales. Um, part of our target group was uh, rural man and um, Aboriginal. Mm. Um, when I came to Grenfell, um, our, our Indigenous community is not that great big because our population in the more rural towns only four thousand, so it's about two point seven percent of those who are who identify as indigenous. Um, I was a very good advocate and um, asking the council to fly the Aboriginal flag, um, starting up NADOC committee, um, and advocating for um, us indigenous people to give us a voice and identity and make connection back to our land. Fantastic. Can I just? Um I'll jump in first, because um, I think there's a, there's a theme that's come through both through what Bridget has said and, and, and yourself, and I can certainly relate it to my own experience about it. And I, I, love, I love that Bridget kind of falling into advocacy without really knowing it. So I did a lot of volunteer stuff in the LGBTI space um, prior to getting in, involved in suicide prevention in any way. So I think that, you know, that's if, if people are watching and wondering how to get start getting involved, a good way is to just start volunteering somewhere that you're passionate about. Put your feet on the ground and just volunteer somewhere it's a really good grounding um space what about you anwin do you, is that your experience in terms of you know how to how to dip your toe in and at least get started um i think for me personally i kept waiting until i knew enough or i was established enough or i felt comfortable enough and that is not a place you can actually reach like the whole point of lived experience advocacy is you're basing it off your own um, experiences. So I've already experienced things, like I've already lived. So that's my basis for helping or creating change. And I think it's really important to um, be confident that you could help and make change where you are as you are right now without having to be any more than what you already are. Um, that was really what kind of got me started, I think, was kind of getting to that recognition point, yeah. That's such a good point, Anne Reno. If I think of, um, yeah, if I think of uh, the number of people I've come across in terms of lived experience, people and going, 
I don't know if I'm ready yet or if I've got enough knowledge in X, Y, and Z, but as you say, come as you are because you're good enough right now. You've got you've got it in the bag in terms of lived experience. So, yeah, perfect, perfect. All right, I am going to um, pose a question to you, Anne, and then, then I'm going to circle back and um, ask, ask each of you another question again. So, Anwen, could you talk to us about a time when you have needed a service or received support for emotional distress, distress that has been a good experience for you and what made that a good experience for you? What are the, what are the key ingredients to that being a good experience for, for us? Um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, in, I have two kind of major examples, I think, of having a good um, service. So the first one I'll talk about is like in the healthcare like space because I think it's quite hard to get a good, um, it's quite challenging to get a good experience in healthcare, to be honest, and especially when you take into consideration like suicide, um, ideation and being LGBT, like it just suddenly, like it doesn't suddenly, it creates uh, more barriers, I think. So um, I think for me is having a um, health professional that was very um, open. I think I think they came to they came to my care. They came to my present like me presenting to them with very like, open mindedness, and so it was very much like uh, gave me an opportunity in a space to tell them. Um, what it is that I'm going through and that wasn't loaded by any characteristics that I might have. So it wasn't loaded by that I am queer. It wasn't loaded by um, other stuff. And that's not to say those things can't impact it. It's that their judgment calls weren't coming from a space of like preconceived ideas about me or how, what I might experience. It was actually just listening to what I experienced rather than, yeah, assuming. Um, so what that looks like, I think, because um, I think it's important to talk about what that looks like, and it's like very open questions. It's removing assumptions from um, language. So there's no gender loadings in questions. There's no assumptions based on romance or partners or anything like that it's actually having a conversation um without yeah without that to start with and I think um and also about you know not just like things to do with partners or whatever it's about everything it's like what what are your interests um those kind of questions are keeping them more open and I think that that kind of translates to what worked well for me in a workplace setting in terms of receiving help and support. So um, I was working uh, a few years ago in a government department and I was having, experiencing a lot of distress and it was quite um, scary, I guess, to, cause I was just at this really, I was on an exciting project. I was having a really good time career wise. I was working with a wonderful team and suddenly I had this massive, you know, moment of, what if it like crisis really and it was like who in a workplace do I take this to because they're not a healthcare professional and I did it more I went to people more out of fear than I did out of like you know these people are going to support me it was more like I need to tell them because I wanted to keep my job kind of thing but it actually went very well and it was because of the same kind of things as why it went well in a healthcare setting and it was the openness to what I am telling somebody. So it was being very receptive to um, what it is that I find challenging, what it is that I'm struggling with, and then um, basing um, our kind of plans together um, about what we can do off what I'm telling them because I find a lot of people just freak out and then they're making all kinds of plans that are based on things you haven't necessarily told them so um 
And the other thing that both like in the healthcare setting and the professional setting, what worked well was not removing my agency. And I think that's super important across like everything is that it was a, um, with both of these, like in both of these situations, we worked together to work out what it is that I needed. And while, while both areas like made suggestions, really it was my choice and it was my ultimate needs that were met because that's who's in distress. So that makes sense that it would be my needs that are met. So I think that was also what worked really well. Um, and yeah, like respect for someone else's agency is in, extremely important um, as all, across all aspects of living really. So um, yeah, I think that's what, it, it, in both situations I came out well. So I think they are good examples of something that has worked well for me. Thank you. That's awesome. There's a, a few things to, to unpack in there that I'm sure both um, Chad and, and Bridget can, and I can certainly relate to, um, particularly around um, not asking gender loaded questions. You know, it's, um, um, it's always a challenge. Do you want to just briefly <clears throat> tell us where you are physically located and, and what you're doing um, um, kind of keep you busy these days? I mean, I know, but I'm sure people tuning in would love to know where you are and what's happening for you. Oh, yes, I forgot that important part. So I'm currently in Perth um, and I also go by the pronoun she and her. Um, and I am doing some casual admin stuff for the government. So I've been a data analyst for the last five years and I'm taking a little bit of a break from that um, because I'm finishing, sorry, I'm starting. I wish I was finishing. I'm starting my thesis um, in psychology. So um, I'm looking at psychological distress and association between neurocognitive functioning for anyone that is interested. Anyone who wants to geek out with you, Anwen. Yep. Awesome. Thanks for that. Thank you. Um, any thoughts from Chad and Bridget about what Anwen's just just shared? Because I think it's kind of interesting in terms of what do we need when we go to, when we need help, basically, both in a, in, a, in a work setting or even in social setting, but I guess most importantly, in a time of um, emotional just extreme stress, what is it we might need? Anything you want to uh, build on? No? What do you think about, so what I picked up, Anwen, was to me, it's important, you know, and, and this language is used in this sector, right, about person-centred care. I actually prefer prefer person-led care, to be honest. I think that, you know, even better if the person is able to to actually direct the, direct what's happening. And, and I think when you talked about, oh, I can't remember the wording you used, but it's like a self-determination, right, in terms of it being person-centred, person-led, but also being rights focused and you have our oh, agency having agency over the decision making process about what does and doesn't happen to you in when you're in care so I, I'd looked I think they're absolutely the essence of any good care and treating the person as and where they are now you know in terms of, and I don't mean treating as in but relationship wise um, responding to the person in their situation now irrespective of characteristics that you might or might not have opinions about or know about or almost becomes a bit of a moot point doesn't it you've got a human being in front of you who's actually an emotional pain and if you strip it all away that's the commonality of it all so it'd be even better if we could all operate from that premise that's my little soapbox statement for this evening so <laughs> on this afternoon all righty so let's let's kick on with some more questions and it's back to you Bridget so, yeah. So your second question for you, Bridget, is, yeah, can you talk to, again, it's kind of similar to, to Anwen's question, but more about in your work roles in terms of being, you know, a consumer mm -hmm. advocate and a peer worker. Can you give us an exa a good example of when you've gone, yes, that worked, I did good in terms of, 
advocacy and, and you know, particularly around maybe an LGBTI scenario, if you could. Yeah, so I obviously can't go into full detail for privacy, but I can talk about some general things that have kind of meant that sort of connections with people I've worked with have been better or they've responded saying that they've been happy with sort of the health service or the way that um, we've kind of interacted. Um, so I guess uh, so some, some things have been like, um, for example, if someone comes out, um, they may sort of come out partially, not fully, like they may come out with, oh, I use they, them pronouns, but then not be comfortable just yet to share maybe a name chain or something and trying to be really um, responsive to that in like really acknowledging that it's hard, but also saying like, thank you, that's real privilege that you've shared that with me. And, um, you know, if you ever do feel ready and safe, then, you know, I'd always love to hear more, but, you know, for a moment, if this is all you feel safe, sharing them that's great too like just really thank them for that opportunity um and then really trying to ensure that you actually do use those pronouns um embedded in everything you do your case notes your the when you're speaking about the person when they're not there um when you speak with them um just yeah and say with a name if they're name changes like trying to embed that in everything that you do um trying to make others aware um make it pretty clear if they've used say a person's dead name correct them um be very uh clear and just constant reminders because you know people's brains they can take a little while switch over even when say someone gets married and their surname changes it can take a little bit before someone kind of goes oh that's right that's right you got a new name um but it doesn't mean that you should be complacent. Like you need to, you know, make sure that, you know, people are definitely actively trying to do that. And even as a service, it depends on obviously the service, but some services say they have like electronic notes, uh, electronic medical records. Um, sometimes for some services, it's possible to actually change the name on the record without it actually being a legal name change. Um, and you can actually change it so that then wherever they go to another part of the service they're not being dead named every time they meet a new person the person looks up their medical record essentially so I feel like those are just some things that can kind of just help a bit and also things that I have had consumers come back and say it has been helpful and it's also kind of given them the chance say if they're not out in all areas of their life to kind of experience what it could be like if they yeah. do eventually get to a place where they're safe enough to be out in all areas of life like to have that to be referred by the name and the pronouns that they actually are and to kind of experience I guess hopefully that gender euphoria but being called you know who, who they are essentially being acknowledged for who they are so yeah I think um yeah those are sort of some things that sort of organizations can do that really aren't too hard to do like yeah. yeah they're just or even just essentially are just things that we should just naturally do really yeah yeah treat each other as humans yeah yeah but isn't it interesting as you say it it does seem like it's almost common in common sense and what we should do as humans but it can be transformative but as you say i love that that analogy that you know when someone gets married and changes their name people just get into habits of using different naming conventions mm. or not, right? Um, can you just explain to anyone who's, who might be tuning in in terms of what, what dead name means, for, just for anyone who doesn't actually know what that Yeah, means. sorry, I realised I probably should have said that. Dead name is usually the person's legal name or the birth name um, and usually the name that they no longer go by. Um, and it's essentially called a dead name because it's no longer used, it's dead. Um, and to use someone's dead name, um, accidentally you simply apologize make sure you correct yourself move on um, try to apologize too many times it can make the person feel like they're being a nuisance really yeah. when really you don't want that them to feel that way um, and it's essentially yeah my brain has had my mark I can't remember where else I was going with that but 
yeah, just it's really important to make sure that you don't dead name someone on purpose. Just yeah, yeah. yeah. Do, do your very best to use the name that they go by. It's just kind of respectful, isn't it? Really, at the end of the day, if you if you yes. know yeah. what that is. But yeah, but uh, yeah, absolutely. Move on if you if you do make a mistake, just um, apologise, but move on. Don't labour the point. Wonderful. Um, I'm going to I'm going to come over to to Chad now and ask Chad another question. So get ready, Chad. Um, <laughs> so um, <laughs> um, what words of advice could you offer offer others wanting to get involved as in lived experience advocacy and suicide prevention? Um, so in other words, what have been the biggest learnings for you? Uh, and one important thing that you think so an important skill or quality to have so i'll let you unpack that a little bit okay um i'd advise anyone with that lived experience to join and speak uh, we need to hear your voice we need to help break that stigma around in our communities um, by sharing your story uh, can help so many people and um, other people will tend to reach out to you once they know that you've got that lived experience um, it's happened to me quite a lot and that's how i fell into my role um, I wanted to make a difference um, with my lived experience as an LGBTI male and as an Aboriginal boy, um, just to speak, to give people that confidence that they're not alone, you're not alienated, we all go through it. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of avenues you can go through. Um, like um, I think it was Owen said that she was, no, sorry, Bridget, was volunteering in uh, community groups and such. Um, there's you know, a lot of groups on Facebook as well, you know, um, join them, speak up, because it can help someone so much. You just don't know the actual impact it can help someone. Um, so that really covers my skills and quality of that, um, being a part of that change, you know, to prevent suicide. Um, you know, there's a project I've been working on with Towards Zero Suicide, and that's from a lived experience, to create safe haven cafes. Um, because from a clinical view, it's quite scary when ourselves in that situation present to a hospital ED area and, you know, it's very confronting. Um, so we're trying to break that down and um, using people such as ourselves to advocate and assist someone in that crisis. Um, yeah, thank area. you. That's brilliant. Um, I think I think it's it touched on a couple of things that we've kind of already talked about, and that is just do it. Find somewhere, find your tribe, wherever that may be, somewhere you want to volunteer. And it doesn't have to be in a mental health or a suicide so prevention space. It could be anything. I think my first LGBTI. Now that I look back, advocacy stuff was actually for Brisbane Pride Fair on the management committee. You know, so um, which which is arguably all, all sunshine and rainbows and lollipops, right? But actually, in fact. Um, the day is also an important one in terms of um, looking after people's mental health and connecting with community and all of that. So um, there's a bit more to it. But but yeah, it just again, it, it to me echoes that it's really about um, finding somewhere that you, you want to contribute. But also then, Chad, I love how you, you said that, you know, kind of by the nature of what we're doing, we become kind of role models for other people who go, okay, okay, I don't have to feel like I'm on my own here and I do have something to contribute, you know, or even just be with other people. And whether people become advocates or not is kind of a moot point, but in terms of people, you know, feeling connected to others who may have a shared experience. Yes, exactly. Um, you know, like with people knowing myself in the community, my role, what I do, and my lived experience, um, uh, we were seeing a lot of deaths to suicide um, and I've had so many people reach out to me of um, in, intervening in crisis situations um, because they know they can trust. They know you understand what they're going through. You have some sort of picture. You understand how they, what's going on in your mind. Yeah. And it's great. It's been really great. Um, you know, and doing the awareness raising, providing all the information, on services out there, you know, especially the Q life for those younger ones that, you know, really struggle in our rural communities and Indigenous communities as well, mm -hmm. not knowing where to go to, who to speak to, and they identify me, they go, okay, Chad's gay, yes, I'm going to go talk to him, 
Yeah, it takes them a little bit of time, but they, you know, come around yeah. and you just guide them, guide them with your experiences and um, show them that it's not hard. Yeah. Be proud of who you are. You have a voice and just being proud. Yeah, good on you. Um, that reminds me of, I think that, um, I'm wondering if you feel the same in terms of, I feel like, you know, through the journey of being working in suicide prevention and mental health over the last six years, what I've what I've learned about me is I've become a really good human walking resource. <laughs> so you get pretty good at knowing if you don't already know what services are relevant for particular people, you make it your job to go out and find out about them. So and, and find out what resources might suit suit people. So yeah, um, I'm sure that's your experience too in terms of just being really good resourceful, right? In terms of going, okay, I don't particularly know this person's particular circumstances or even their, their cultural background or whatever it might be. Um, but I know how to go and look about, how to go about finding that information. So that's, to me, also part of skill development is learning to be a good advocate, is being able to kind of be a bit resourceful about what are the services and supports and even websites and phone lines that are around that, that you can then, you know, support other people when you needed to, because as Chad said, it happens once you're working as a lived experience advocate in whatever role, because people, and rightly so, people go, oh, that's a safe person. Sorry, but I'm gonna call it as it is. And, and you know, I can talk to that person. So, yeah. That's right, it helps break down the stigma. Yeah. It, it really does, um, especially within our rural man and indigenous communities, um, that stigma that faces you know, sexuality and especially uh, suicide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure, for sure. All right, Anne, when are you ready for another question? Coming at you. So pre in your previous role, you worked for the National Mental Health Commission. And as you mentioned, you're currently studying um, to be a psychologist. What is the, What have these two experiences taught you about being a LGBTI slash suicide prevention slash lived experience advocate have have they shaped you in any way in terms of what you do and how you how you advocate? <laughs> yes, um, <laughs> short answer. Uh, um, so I think that especially my work at the Mental Health Commission, um, and they have, they, I don't know what stage it's at now, but they were doing peer workforce guidelines. Um, and they were, um, and I know another organisation also has some peer workforce guidelines. Um, things like, things like though, uh, developing those alongside also developing um, or implementing suicide prevention programs is like, um, yeah, has been really important, but I think it's also, while doing this alongside studying psychology, although I'm only studying psychology, I'm not yet at the point of studying to be a psychologist technically. So, um, <laughs> um, but seeing that alongside such a clinical kind of um, like, clinical slash medical system has really highlighted to me the importance of peer and support work and um, really personally like uh, for me has um, just driven home the point of how um, crucial it is and I think that um, a lot of times it's not necessarily considered from a clinical angle so a clinical or medical model usually is like assumed to have the answers kind of thing. Like, you know, you go to the clinical or medical model and then you have a diagnosis or you have a treatment intervention or whatever. Um, and I think that the peer and support roles are just so essential to not just supporting people going through things, but also to helping them understand the clinical model, like how many times have you been asked, how does this work um, by someone who's in crisis? And when you're coming from the clinical perspective, you aren't necessarily able to even explain 
how it does work because, well, you just show up to work every day. And so um, you don't necessarily think about how someone might access that. Um, and I think, yeah, it's been really interesting experiencing those things alongside each other, I think, for me. Um, and I would be, yeah, I'm really interested to see how they can become more, um, like, I guess, entwined. Like, I know there's a really big, like, peer support and peer workers are really keen, obviously, to get more, I don't know if acknowledgement is the right word, but even just more of a voice within the clinical side, as in, like, please actually listen to what we're saying. We are experts on ourselves. Um, so, yeah, that's been really big for me. Um, yeah. Bridget, did you want to chime in in there or, or chat? I do have something to say, but I'm yeah. going to back at this point and just let somebody else go for a second. Yeah, I, <laughs> um, at our workplace, I think we're one of the workplaces that has the largest amount of foot experienced workers in, I think, Victoria. Um, so I think we've got about 26 or 28 staff, uh, but we're spread out over a pretty large mental health service. So then it ends up being probably like a couple of staff at per service. Uh, and yeah, I think we still, even though we've got a lot of peer workers and extreme students and whatever, um, it's still a fight to kind of be recognised. Like we get to go to the meetings, like the clinical reviews and stuff like that. And it's, you know, a real privilege to get to sit in on those, but it's still a fight to have sometimes, sometimes not all the time, but sometimes to have our voice considered or to have our voice the same weight as say a psychiatrist or um, social worker's voice. Especially if say they've worked in the service for 30 years and here you are coming in fresh, you know, new, first year in your job and you're trying to say something and and some people take that really well and they go yeah you are an expert in lived experience because you've lived it and then other people are kind of like well what do you know you haven't done a degree in a qualification or whatever so it can be it just really depends on some of the people you're working with and also the way the service actually supports you as well so if the service is supporting you well they will kind of go, hang on, no, this person's voice is really important and try and really put that at the forefront. I think a lot of services, even the service I work for, is you're trying to figure out how does that look because it's never really been done before. So I think Royal Commission will definitely help with that, at least in Victoria. Not can't really speak for other states, but um, hopefully, yeah, the voice of lived experience can hold eventually one day the same weight or even more weight than say a consultant psychiatrist or something yeah I'll just um I know from the from the work we're doing in in New South Wales in particular um that's part of the work we're doing is about um uh, so we formed a number of um right across the state lived experience advisory groups and one of the key topics and pieces of work that's being done is about how do you address the power imbalances in the room and how do you make sure it's an equitable space so that you can contribute equally um, and it's a journey I do think we're on a big massive journey culturally across systems as more and more clinical workforces get introduced um, they're quite new in Australia so and but I love Anne when how you talked about <clears throat> It doesn't have, for me, it doesn't always have to be, and there is some argument for always sometimes being just a non-clinical workforce, in other words, a peer workforce, but there's certainly a place for both. So it's a blended workforce of clinical and non-clinical. Um, and just, you know, and I, I do think you're right. I think it's how do we bridge those, how do we bridge those relationships and go, we actually can work alongside each other. We both, you know, both both um, skill sets and, and lived experiences bring bring something to it to the work right um last week I was and it's one of my most privileged kind of piece of work I do um last week I co-facilitated on behalf of Rose in the Ocean with um it's called STARS training it's a, a suicide uh risk assessment protocol um with four new psychologists who are being trained up to then become trainers for the for this and it's, it was just such a privilege because they're so open and so um, so receptive, right? And 
and I think that catching people when they're doing their training is a perfect time to go. That's when we probably should be having those discussions about what lived experience means and what we can bring to bring to the work of um, helping people in, in, in a supportive way. Okay, uh, I can, I'm just watching the time. We are at the point where I said I was going to open up just for any questions, if any of the participants want to pose questions. So I will stop the questions there. So I'm going to stop grilling, grilling everyone now. Um, and I'm going to open up. Uh, I'll just have to go in and um, let all the participants have the option to, to chat if they, um, if they wish. So and I'm just um, doing that now, just bear with me. So can I just get an indication from people who are online whether they're able to now at least um, see the chat function and put something in? If somebody could please write to us, that would be fantastic. <laughs> Oh, we've got a new message. Yep, beautiful. Lovely. Okay, so we're, um, we're, we're, oh, look, we've got a question. Let me just, it's in the Q&A function. Who knew? Let me open that up. Just bear with me. Fantastic. Thank you, Jennifer. It's awesome that you can hear me. Does anyone, while well, well, we're kind of just um, come to the end of, I guess, the formal part of the webinar in terms of um, questions, is there anything anyone online would like to, to ask any of us? And that can be, be any of us, me from Brisbane, Bridget from Melbourne, Chad down in Griffith and Anne went over in Perth. Just checking the Q&As. While I'm waiting, while I'm waiting to see if there are any questions, then we, look, we won't, if, if there aren't questions, what we'll do is we will wrap up a little bit early, which will, will let people go off and have, have their evening meals or whatever, whatever you're doing, wherever you are at the moment. But I'll do a bit of a plug for the next um, uh, webinar and the next professional development, uh, lived experience professional development webinar will be next month in April. Um, yet to be, uh, yet to be, in yet to be announced so if you can just keep an eye on our website and uh, go along to, to the page you'll, you'll be able to find out when it's announced but we also do promote it via social media so keep an eye out for our social media if you do use social media oh there's another yeah I was gonna say oh Matilda there's a question <laughs> right so can you see them as well Bridget yeah I, for some reason I can open up the Q&A why don't you want to read it out and we'll, we'll, we'll yeah to it? yeah so there's actually yeah, so there's two questions now in the chat. So there's one from Stephen Scott saying, okay. I'd, be, I'd be interested to know what you think is the most important thing to be changed for the benefit of people with lived experience from the LGBTIQ plus community. And shall, I, shall we answer Stephen's first and then yeah. I'll read yeah. Chad's? Well, directed at Chad. Yep. Cool. Does, does someone, would someone like to answer? I'll, I'll have a little think. Yeah, One second. I've, uh, sorry, I've just closed the question. I'm going to have to go back to it. Mm. So, so the, the question to me looks like it's around what needs to be changed for the benefit of people with lived experience uh, from the LGBTI community. And I guess we're talking about uh, in suicide prevention, given that that's the focus of today's webinar. Um, I think, Anne, when you touched on a couple of things that are kind of really really, really fundamental. And that is, can we please stop the gendered language, please? Because that just immediately becomes a barrier to people wanting to open up and feel feel safe to do so when, you know, particularly when people are in, in times of need. And I think the second thing, and again, Anne, back to you, was around, it's about not seeing a person's characteristics or whatever might be going on, just seeing them as a whole human, a bit human being in front of you and connecting on, on that level that's from me but what about you Chad what what do you think needs to change what needs to be done differently in terms of responding um, to people LGBTI people in suicide crisis um that one I'm not really sure I'm sorry uh, I don't think about it um 
I think it's more the cultural sensitivity um, right. um, that we need to look at, you know, um, finding those safe spaces, um, you know, that lived experience as we have spoken, many of us have. Um, so what does that look like trauma informed? So does that look like, you know, having some sort of sense of cultural confidence around the work you do uh, and, and particularly the people who come to your service or? Yes, um, but yeah, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> just, oh, no, no, it's all good. Just lost my train of thought. Um, it's okay. I do apologize. No, no. What about you, you, Bridget? You're working, as I say, you're working yeah. in a one on one support role too. I would and say holistically. Yes, yeah, so I think in terms of actual lived experience, um, in terms of advocacy, I'd say providing people a space at the table to actually speak, um, actually letting those intersections come and speak because often it's like just the LGBT person or just a person who has lived experience of suicide or whatever other intersection, like actually having those multiple intersections that can bring such diverse and interesting experiences that may not be considered otherwise. Um, and in terms of actually working one-to-one -one with consumers, I would say um, validation, trying to really build connection, trying to um, not go straight to problem solving or freak out mode. Like I could just try to explore what's going on for them and hear what the untold story is, which is what I've kind of been learning. My intentional peer support training um, is instead of when often people are talking about suicide, which is something I kind of realized, I already did, I just didn't realize the word for it, but they're often talking about pain, emotional yeah, yeah. pain. They're not actually, they don't actually want to die. They're, they've got, there's something that's making them feel that way and yeah so just trying to actually explore that and what what is it that's actually making them get to that place well, I'm actually so glad you said so, yeah. that I think that's so spot on in terms of connecting someone's emotional pain as opposed to you know trying to crisis manage somebody wants to die you know that's mm. actually not what's going on you've got to find out what's actually what, what's actually going on for the person in terms of the emotional pain and just to pick up and it is one of my my pet little things I do bang on about a little bit in particularly the strategic level and you know an advisory group level or lived experience advisory group or any any project where they're bringing lived experience people together to form a project or make some decisions is can we please make sure there's not there there is more than one one of those so it's it's really hard when you've just got when you are the one who ticks the number of check boxes and you're invited along, which is a, a privilege, absolutely, but it can be pretty daunting um, to sit in, in in those spaces with the power imbalances going on, particularly if you are a number of a num wearing a number of hats at one point. Exactly, like as me as a lesbian identifying woman, I cannot speak for the trans community um, or and say another community like the bisexual community. So yeah. I think that's also really important. Is going, okay, well, if we want to be uh, getting advocacy or um, lived experience from the LGBTIQ plus community, then we need to actually get a person from each community. We can't just get one person and go, okay, they're, they're going to cover the whole beautiful umbrella of, that makes up the LGBTIQ plus community. So our experiences are so different. Yeah, I think that's, you've actually kind of, it, uh, perfectly summed up that's exactly I I worry when myself or anyone's invited along and we're we're, we're supposed to be um, there because we oh that fits a number of the criteria of people we want to hear from and I'm, one of the first things I normally say is I actually can only speak for me and my experience I can't speak on behalf of other people whilst we, we might be from queer communities I, I'm as you say I'm not trans and I'm, I'm not bisexual so you know it's um yeah, it's a tricky one because I can also see, you know, particularly the bigger the system saying, oh, but, you know, it's all about how many people can we have around the table and blah, blah, blah. But Stephen's asking what's what's the, what, what needs to be changed. Well, that's the answer. <laughs> Should um, we do Chad's question or and what would you like to do? Yeah. Sorry. Shall I read that chat? Uh, the question that was directed at Chad? Yeah, go um, So Mark asked... 
is asking Chad, uh, would you like to say where you get support? Thank you, Mark, for your question. Um, I get a lot of support um, from a lot of different um, avenues and services. Uh, the one uh, service that I do use is the Mental Health Line, which is a New South Wales service. Uh, it's a very good service um, and anyone can use that service. You don't have to be in a crisis situation if you're a carer or a family, a friend member of someone that you feel um, needs extra support, you can call and they will um, assist you on what you need to do and steps to take to help keep the person safe and so forth. Um, the other service I do use is QLife and um, it's a very great service. Um, I feel comfortable, you know, proud to use it. And um, I do join in um, some Facebook group chats as well, um, LGBT groups. Um, I know it's not um, a counselling service as such or so forth, but it's good sometimes just to talk what's on your mind or get something off your chest and listening to other people's um, experiences um, to help you or guide you um, in which direction you need to go. Um, you know, the lived experience is uh, very important. Um, I did a training session through Roads in the Ocean to talk, learn how to talk about them. Uh, learn how to talk about and tell my story of lived experience and using that, um, those key points of that story to help someone else. Uh, so they take that away, uh, even though you're not directing it all about yourself, but it's giving them those key points of where they need to go and seek help or um, what might have worked for you could help them. It might not, but um, yeah. it gives them some avenue to explore. Thanks, Chad. Great question. Great question. Thanks, Mark. That's brilliant. Look, we're, we are just about out of time and I do want to make sure we wrap up on time so that people can leave. Look, I'm I'm always um, I'm actually always happy when I'm with this with these group of people because they are, you know, part of my tribe in terms of being a queer person. So I love it when we get to come together and, and um, just as you are still tuned in. We've already been doing some great work in terms of reviewing content for our workshops for Rose in the Ocean, and that's proving to be such a useful exercise and we'll continue that work. So I'm, I'm very honoured to, to be part of this group and get to lead it for Rose in the Ocean. Um, uh, and thank you everyone who's, who's tuned in. As I said, look after yourselves, um, do what you need to do for your own self care um, and reach out if you do need some support after, after the webinar has finished. Um, and thank you for, for tuning in. As I said, the next webinar will be next month, sometime next month. Just keep an eye on our website and um, that, 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 that'll be announced soon. So that's all from us. Um, we do look forward to maybe catching up with you again um, and have a wonderful evening. Bye for now. <laughs>